Welcome to Capital Preview, a weekly bipartisan discussion with Iowa legislators about the key issues facing our state. Brought to you by Mediacom. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Capital Preview. My name is Bill Peard. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Iowa Cable and Telecommunications Association. This is brought to you in conjunction with Mediacom to sponsor a conversation with our senators and House members uh, in the Iowa General Assembly. Um, our guest today is Senator Zach Nunn. He's a Republican from Polk and Jasper County. As an officer with the U.S. Air Force, Zach answered his country's call to serve the greater good. He just returned from the military deployment and has flown 700 air combat hours. Thank you, Senator, hey, Bill. For, Thanks for, having for me being here. with us yeah, this absolutely. morning. Absolutely. Uh, why don't you go talk a little about employ your deployment because it's been interesting <laughs> and you're right. a busy man. Right. And, well, like like all yeah. legislators up there, right. um, serving in the state house is our part-time job. Right. Uh, my other job is to serve as a commander with the Iowa Air National Guard. I've been in the military for 16 years, both active and guard. And um, we recently had an opportunity to take over a deployment rotation for the 24th Expeditionary Reconnaissance Squadron. And that flies uh, an aircraft in um, theater. It's a, we would call it a reconnaissance aircraft. Some people would say a spy plane. But it um, basically collects uh, adversary activity. And then we also help to verify what's going on and make sure that our um, our friends in Russia are doing what they're supposed to be doing and what they say they're doing. Um, and then where there's a hot spot in places like Syria, or in this case, as we recently saw here in January uh, in Iran, that we've got um, good overwatch of what's happening so that we can see uh, threats before they emerge to keep Americans safe, mm -hmm. but then also to hopefully keep others in the world um, secure in their environment. Um, also, the senator, and I, I failed to mention this, has served on the White House National oh. Security Council and is a career intelligence officer. So yeah. it's pretty impressive. And then you have time to be a senator. Well, I, 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 we were talking earlier. The, the, what's truly impressive is that my wife, while I was deployed for 138 days, was taking care of four kids, yeah. and she still let me come back home. So yeah. I would say she's got, she's got the impressive job. Right. <laughs> Lots of flowers on Friday. Right, right, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, What's the appetite for educational spending in the Iowa legislature this year? Yeah, so this is always, I think, collectively, both Republicans and Democrats, our first priority to say, how much of the apple can we give to K through 12 public schools in Iowa? And I'm happy to say that the House and the Senate have um, really come into close alignment here. We're looking at roughly um, 75 to $90 million in new money going into schools. And that in total would put about, with all of our funding from our just state supplemental aid, which my goal is to get done within the first 30 days of session and get that out so schools have a plan. Additionally, what we raise from property tax, and anybody that has property tax in here will know that that's the largest portion of your property tax goes to our K-12 through schools. Mm -hmm. And then um, we pass a local option sales tax to help infrastructure, security, and technology. Additionally, the feds will provide us some matching money. So in total, we're putting about seven billion, with a B, dollars towards K through 12 schools uh, if this bill passes. Uh, that's, that's historically high, but to put that in perspective, seven billion dollars going through K through 12 funding is the equivalent of the entire state budget. So just what we have in the state, wow. we're spending that much on our K through 12 schools. It's a priority, but it's also a really good investment. We've seen Iowa be first in ACTs, first in graduation rates, um, first in students taking both college classes while they're in high school, in the nation, this is where we want to be. In total, that's $15,000 per student per classroom in Iowa. I think that's a very good mark to be at. I do too. Um, what are some of the priority investments and in, in where we can better manage taxpayer dollars? Uh, so I'll offer, <laughs> I'll offer three options here. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to make sure, I've talked to my superintendents, I've been in my classrooms, I've seen what happens when a student becomes um, either a challenge or has a mental or emotional um, situation in the classroom. I want to make sure that in the first 30 days we are funding that mental health aspect of what the classroom needs through behavioral awareness. This means uh, making sure teachers have the skill trainings that they need so that if a student has a behavioral issue, they know how to create a safe environment for that student while not putting the other students in that classroom at risk or themselves. Um, I'd like to see several million dollars going just to that program. A second area that we need to look at is transportation aid. Um, 
there are different schools in Iowa. My district's a perfect example. I have some very close suburban schools and I have some very rural schools. Mm -hmm. A kid on a bus for an hour, an hour and a half in the morning is hard on that student. It's also a big cost for the school. So what can we do to make sure our rural schools have the funding they need for that transportation aid? And then the final piece I'll say is per pu pupil equity. I'd like to plus that up not just to the $5 that's been talked about, but $10 per student to bring all of our student pay that $15,000 per student um, closer aligned. So that if you're from a rural school, an urban school, or a suburban school, uh, they all have the same opportunity to learn. But I will offer this. We also need to be holding our taxpayer dollars accountable. One of the biggest challenges that I see and one of the things that we're going to be working at the State House is making sure that top level management pay is proportional and transparent to what's happening um, in the rest of the area. So right now I'll give you a, a keen example. We've got a, a superintendent in Iowa who's making more than the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. military. I think it's a very important job to be a superintendent mm -hmm. and we want those people to be recruited because of their caliber. At the same time, I don't know that any superintendent has a job that is more difficult than leading the entire U.S. Department of Defense. So let's have some equity, let's have some transparency, and then let's not let that management pay run away at a much higher rate than what average teacher pay in Iowa is. And, and that just requires us to be transparent about it and then turn it over to the school boards to make the best decision. Yeah, I mean, and that definitely puts it in perspective right. a little bit. Right. right. Um, you sponsor some important bills on, on transparency and nonpartisan in local elections. Tell us why this is so important. <laughs> so <laughs> on the heels of the Iowa caucus, right? Yeah. On the heels of the Iowa caucus. So I think one of the big things here is that we have seen our nonpartisan elections in Iowa, particularly in recent day months, become very partisan. Mm -hmm. Iowa prides itself on that we have nonpartisan redistricting. The the legislature doesn't do it. We have nonpartisan reviews of candidates. We have a nonpartisan board you can go to if you have um, a, a disagreement with an opponent. We keep our local city councils, our school boards, our board of trustees nonpartisan, meaning an independent can run, a Republican, a Democrat, anybody can run, and you don't have to take a blood oath to a specific party. Mm -hmm. What we saw in the 2019 elections was a huge influx of mailers and postage being paid for by Polk County Democrats trying to influence local elections. Um, and I'm sure both parties have been guilty of this in the past. Mm -hmm. My request is no more county and party money going to nonpartisan elections. If we want to make our school board a partisan place, then make it a partisan election. Mm. But I will say this, 87% of Iowans don't think that's a good idea. We like our nonpartisan non school districts. We like our nonpartisan city councils. It would be a shame to have a city have to say, I'm a blue city or I'm a red city or a school district say, I'm only a Republican city. And in this last election, serving members, future members were attacked because of the letter that came after their name, like you can see on the board there, right. versus the quality of individual that they were. Mm -hmm. And I don't want independents to be cut out of this. There's too many good people in our state to serve. Let's keep nonpartisan elections nonpartisan. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and coming from a nonpartisan right. <laughs> position that I was mayor for 14 years. Yes, sir. Um, y you know, I, I think people looked at me as very nonpartisan right. and as somebody that, that led the city and wasn't partisan on either side. So, And yeah. isn't that refreshing that you can go into the high V and you can have a Democrat or Republican or independent come and say, hey, Mr. Mayor, right. thanks for your service, or hey, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I got right. a problem with my right. pothole in my right. road. They're yeah. not coming up to you saying, where do you stand on President Trump's right. foreign policy? Yep. That just I, I Let's so keep agree because it it's about a community, right? And it's not about the partisan part of it. So. I would agree. And there's room for both. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk technology a little bit because I know you're a big technology person. <laughs> um, and um, the Iowa Caucus app put a black eye on Iowa. Um, you're working on a bill to make Iowa a cybersecurity leader. And, right. Uh, so the the caucus was a challenge um, for the app. It was not a challenge for the way that we do caucuses. I mean, I was out at my Republican caucus and we had an app and it worked absolutely fine. Nobody right. talks about that. Right. I went to my, uh, looked over at my Democrats and the folks who had been doing it for years were still doing a great job. Mm -hmm. that, that, the process is not broke. What is broke is the fact that the technology was not keeping up. And here's why I'll offer this. That technology was rolled out very quickly at a cost of roughly $60,000 and as a result, we didn't only not beta test it before we rolled out, we hadn't even alpha tested it very thoroughly. And so it should be a surprise to no one that it didn't succeed. 
If Iowa wants to be a technology leader, I think that we need to work on three key things. One, we've got to have the right people to do the technology, and we have a great program with that through our community colleges, Iowa State and the University of Iowa. We've got to have a technology element here. And in my district, we've been very fortunate to have some major data centers from LightEdge to Facebook, and now we've got Amazon coming to the district, mm -hmm. who are technology hubs. And they're bringing with them a certain spark that inspires an entrepreneur to go out there and say, how do I use this technology in my business? And then the third part of this is, you gotta have a policy that makes sense. And so right now in Iowa, um, I've sponsored legislation that would make Iowa the first state in the nation to prohibit taxpayer dollars going to ransomware. Ransomware is where they take over your computer and they seize it, particularly at the state level. We saw this in Texas this summer, where hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars were paid to organizations that we don't know whether they're affiliated with terrorism or crime to unlock state computers, city computers, because the cities and the state and the counties had not taken time to come up with a mitigation plan. Just like what we saw in the caucuses, mm -hmm. no one was thinking ahead on how do we come up with a backup. The time to plan for a crisis isn't after the crisis, it's before the crisis. And what this bill intends to do is to say, let's start coming up with a mitigation strategy for data management, for cybersecurity ahead of time, so that we're not paying out hundreds of thousands, or in the case of um, Baltimore and Florida, millions of dollars to elements that could very likely be criminal related, and some of them have been linked to terrorist elements. Hmm. Well, and we, and we know that it's, we know that it's rampant, right? I mean, because we've got countries right. that, are, that are sponsoring this. Or sponsoring this. Ransomware, Sponsor. since 2019, has doubled. Um, it is now in pretty much every major environment. There are cyber insurance policies just for ransomware. And what happens is it takes over your computer, you can't get into it, and all of a sudden you say, hey, I guess I'll pay this guy and hopefully I get yeah. my, my information back. And we're seeing a lot of times that's not even the case. You pay the money, you might as well be paying it to an online casino because you're never going to see that money again. Yeah. Uh, Senator, I'd like to just, if I could, I mean, we've, we've covered a lot of yeah. uh, ground <laughs> in a short time. Right. But, but I'd, like to, I'd like to just maybe... Uh, run through your feelings. We talked a little bit before the show yeah. started about the caucus. Um, and, and if we're, if yeah. we're going to save it, um, <laughs> or, or what kind of damage do you think? So, we, we, as Iowans, we are all fans of what the caucus brings. Right. Um, and here's why I think the caucus survives in Iowa. Um, first and foremost, Iowa is three million people. Mm -hmm. It's readily accessible to whether you are a, if Bloomberg would have come here, he would have been able to spend a lot of money, but so can a guy like Pete Buttigieg. Um, let's go back a couple of cycles. You can have a guy like Jimmy Carter uh, come out here and run and actually do really, really well mm -hmm. because you get to have what we call the, the Iowa press the flesh, knock on the door, talk to folks one-on-one, -on -one, share, share a rack of ribs, and by the end of it, a presidential candidate might be convincing a small group of people of the importance of Iowa. The other aspect that I think is really important here is that, um, now I'm going to get a little political with you, mm. is that individuals who have spent time, the Amy Klobuchar's, the Pete Buttigieg's, even the Ted Cruz's or the Mark Rubio's who might want to run for president in the future, they've got an infrastructure here. They've spent time and money on the ground in Iowa. I can't see them wanting to just give that up to start over for who knows what. Right. And I had offered that's the real reason that Iowa continues to do well in the caucuses year after, or election cycle after election cycle is, all right, if not Iowa, then who? Right. And if we're going to move this to a major East Coast state or West Coast state, you're going to immediately find that little guys don't get to participate. The Pete Buttigieg who ends up winning Iowa can't do that in California. Uh, the Jimmy Carter can't go to Texas and win in that environment. So ultimately, we, if we move it out of Iowa, we risk making the caucuses really, a, or the first in the nation status, really about who has the most money and who gets to decide what they do. All right, S Senator Zach Nunn, I appreciate your time this morning. Always, Bill. It's been Thank a you. great conversation. Um, stay tuned for another episode of Capital Preview.